Many people in the history of Christianity have read the Bible and they recognize, well, it says this here and it says this here and uh, they seem to be different. And what is that? And sometimes you just push it aside and say, I'm not going to bother with that. Or they try to find a way to put them together. But what we've been trying to demonstrate is that sometimes there are things that are different because they are different because God was doing this at one time and is now doing this. And one of the things that he is doing now is that he is structuring our lives, dealing with us as his people, as his household today, the body of Christ, the church, by his grace. And not only by his grace, but then as he does so by his grace, by this same word, this stewardship or administration, also by faith. We live by faith today. But in order to live by faith, we need to know some promises from God so that we can direct faith at them. I'm Pastor Tim Holsher, and we've been looking at how reading our Bibles in a normal manner and recognizing distinctions will lead us to live by grace and to live by faith. And as we're looking at these promises, we've been looking lately at promises regard to our spiritual enemies, promises of operating by grace, promises of maturing. And return to Colossians chapter 1 today in verse 28. Kind of you're jumping into, not the middle of the book, but a fair number, a fair, well, 28 verses in, a fair distance into the book. Paul writes, we proclaim him, referring to Jesus Christ, right here, Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him, admonishing, that means, that's, that's kind of like a, an instruction, but that's kind of has a little bit of a warning with it. Think about this. Think about what you're doing, guys. Every man and teaching everyone with all wisdom. So we're using wisdom. We're putting together this truth in a way that it becomes practical. You can see how it works, how you use it, so that we may present everyone, every man. And person is okay here. I just make a, make a note on this. When we have here, and this is the New American Standard, the 2020 edition, and they've taken out in some places, just in some places, some gender terms. And I think this is appropriate here because anthropos does not mean a male. There are some places it does, but most of the time anthropos is used for humanity is the way it's used for all people. So person is okay. I, I hope you're not offended by that because that is, I think, an okay or or. Uh, a legitimate way of handling that term anthropos uh, in some contexts. So he says, but the person is so that we may present every person, man, man, woman, child, complete or mature in Christ. Now, one of the things to note here, first of all, that this word that's translated complete here is a word that we've looked in other places as translated perfect, but we've been pointing out that this has to do with maturity. And isn't maturity, in one sense, kind of a sense of completeness? But the second thing here with regard to this maturity is it says it's in Christ. So this comes back to one of the things that we reiterate again and again, that you and I as believers need to know who we are in Christ, and we need to know how God is has planned for you and I to relate to that, that we actually frame our minds with the truths of who we are in Christ. That becomes, shall we say, the goggles through which we look at the world. Sometimes you talk about people having rose-colored glasses, meaning they have an idealistic view, not a realistic view of the way everything are. This isn't looking at things idealistically and going, oh, I can see the good. No, that's not what he's talking about. What he's saying is from our position in Christ, seeing these things, we're able to look at the things that go on down here. Now, in the context of Colossians, this is very important because they've had some false teachers that have come in and they have really kind of diverted or are attempting to divert some believers away from focusing on Christ and focusing on angels and the worship of angels. And we're not going to tackle all that today in this study. But the Apostle Paul, as he's writing this, has made certain statements, such as back in Colossians 1.15. He, Christ, is the image. He's the, he's the visible, shall we say, the image of the invisible God. 
Now we have this word firstborn of creation, which makes him sound like he's the creator. But what that word firstborn meant is it was a reference to the heir. He's the heir of creation. He can't be part of creation because verse 16, if you just follow it through, does not allow him to be part of creation. It says, for by him, all things were created. The things in the heavens and the earth, the visible and the invisible. In other words, if he created all things, how can he himself be created? Can't. And again, it helps us understand that that's firstborn does not mean, well, he was the first created thing. Well, then he would have had to create himself. But that's not the case. But when we were looking at this up here, as we're thinking about who Christ is, we not only think about our being in Christ, but in the verse just preceding this, if I can get it to go back up here, verse 27, to whom God willed or desired to make known the riches of the glory of this mystery among the, the Gentiles or the nations, that is this mystery that is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ dwelling in you and I as a believer. Here's the creator God, the creator of the universe, the image, the, the, the very, shall we say, God in a physical form. Now, God doesn't have a physical form, but he came down here and he exhibited God in human terms. And this one now indwells us. He said as much in John chapter 14, verse 20. He says, I in you and you in me, or you uh, you in me and I in you. I've got to get the right order. I in you is that last part. He indwells us. And that's the hope of glory. Because Christ dwells in me, you and I have the hope that we actually can live out something about God's reputation, God's character, his glory in this. And so Paul says, well, we proclaim him. We want people to really think clearly about who is Jesus Christ because it's the difference between being mature and not mature. It's a difference between actually living out glory or just living out yourself. We go over to chapter 2 and verse 18. One of the things that these people were doing, and we referenced this a little bit, we're just going to pass through this verse, but verse 18, chapter 2, take care or watch that no one keeps defrauding you. This is a word meaning to act as an umpire. Think of an umpire, somebody sliding the base. Maybe their foot hits home plate, but the, but the, the, the umpire goes out. They umpired against you, even though you were safe. But he says, don't let anybody do that. And they're going to defraud you or umpire against you with regard to this because they want you to be involved in this humility that comes from your own delight, your own desire. You produce it yourself. You produce your own humility rather than a proper humility that comes from a proper perspective of who we are. And then the worship of angels. See, they want you to worship angels instead of worshiping Christ, who is the, well... He is God. He's the one worthy of worship. Taking a stand on visions that he has seen, inflated without cause by his fleshly mind. And when they do that, he says, they're not holding firmly to the head from whom the entire body being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments grows with the growth which is from God. Who's the head? Christ. And so when people get wrapped up in angels and they're they're mesmerized by them and they want to study them and they pretty soon they find themselves worshiping angels, maybe praying to angels, they're not holding to Jesus Christ, the head of the body. They have replaced him. Paul goes down one more. There's more things we could say, but this is in brief. It says in verse one, therefore, since you have been raised with Christ, Keep on seeking the things that are above. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. See, where is Christ today? It's one of the things you had to be taught. He's seated in heaven. You need to know that. The angels are beneath him. Why would you worship them when he's above them and he's seated on the throne and they have to come before him? But he's seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on those things that are above, those things where he is. Set your minds to that. Don't set your mind on, what does he say? The things that are down here on earth. Remember we were saying you understand who you are in Christ and you set that as your perspective. That's your frame of mind. Those are, those are the goggles through, through which you look at the things of life and you, you get to think about them with clarity going, this is who, what's really happening because this is who I am in Christ. And these things down here, that doesn't match. That's inconsistent. That's, that doesn't work because, well, 
these reasons because it's different than this. It's not like setting your mind up here, all of a sudden you understand economics and all that. That's not what I'm trying to say. You have a perspective on the problems that potentially affect you as a believer with regard to your spiritual life. And so he says, set your mind on the things above, not the things that are on the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Where is he? Up there at the Father's right hand. So when Christ who is our life, he is your life in two ways. When you believed in him, you were considered to be raised, to have been resurrected, first crucified, buried, and then resurrected with him. God counts that, credits that to you. None of us actually went through a crucifixion. But secondly, he indwells us that was Colossians 1.27, and that's how you and I have eternal life. That would be 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. All of that to say that if you understand who Christ is, if you, if you grasp these things about who he is right now, not just who he was in the past, not just what he did when he came to earth, I should say, but who he is right now and how God sees you related to him, it's going to keep you away from the ridiculous philosophy and ridiculous developments in religion that are get you focusing on things through which you will never mature. You're always going to be in the nursery. In fact, back at the end of chapter 2, just a few verses back up here, when you do that, you end up being under the, the little things that you tell little kids. Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Is that the way you want to, be, want to live? Do you want to be that person that People need to go around and say, don't touch that, don't taste that, don't don't play with that, don't finger it. Is that what you need? I trust God is, well, God is going to mature you, but I trust you are allowing him to mature. You're cooperating and you are maturing rather than having to go back and do that kind of stuff, which would be a version of law. All of this to say that Paul is saying back here in verse 28, his whole goal of pre presenting who Christ is and how you and I are related to him is to present each person complete in Christ. That means if that was his goal, that has to be a promise from God that it can happen. There's not like a little segment of Christianity, a few believers out there, 10, 20, 1,000 that they can mature, but the rest of them all going to be a mess. No, there has to be the potential because of the work of God that every one of us can mature in Christ. So as always, have a good day in the Lord, because that's where you're going to mature. And thank you for joining me.